Hello, welcome to this fireside chat on COVID-19 and transport. This here is a pre-recorded session with the participants of the Young Leaders and Sustainable Transport Program, a joint activity by SLOCAT and the Volvo Research and Educational Foundations, or short ref. We invited the Young Leaders from 2019 and 2020 to participate in exchange to discuss what's been happening in terms of COVID-19 and what kind of solutions have been implemented in their cities. My name is Nikola Midimorek. I work on data and research analysis for the Slogan Partnership. And together with me, um, the moderation is being done by my colleague Chris Decky, who works on policy advocacy, strategy and engagement. We have the eight, we have eight uh, young leaders with us here. Um, with, it starts with Supri Nodada, who is an urban planner and the avid cyclist and the um, organizer of the critical mass in Nairobi. Then we have Edna Oteambo, who lectures on climate change and land use law at the University of Nairobi. Erika Martin Silva Lamos is a PhD student and uh, at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden with a focus on environmental psychology and, uh, and transportation. Then Seppe Samuel, who is a climate justice advocate and co-founder of and, and as well as organizer of Menget Lesev. Ethiopia's Open Streets Movement. Sema Singh is a PhD candidate on uh, urban transport linkages and gender at the University of Cornell. And then we have with us Agni Veshpani, who is a postdoctoral researcher on, on freight transport at the University of Memphis. Hiro Taka Koike is a, um, a consultant at UNES in, in, in UNESCO right now and uh, joins us from Japan. Then we have, uh, last but not least, Thomas van Dijk, a geographer and urbanist with a specific interest in sustainable urban development of Latin America. And currently he works for Despacio in Bogota, Colombia. So we will now listen to this pre-recorded session about the exchange between two generations of young leaders in sustainable transport. I hope you enjoy it very much and, and have fun. Yeah, thank you, Nicola. So as mentioned, we're really happy to have all of our young leaders here, or most of our young leaders here, um, a group of young leaders from last year's opening inaugural batch of the Young Leaders on Sustainable Transport, and a group of them from this year. Um, it's really nice to see all your faces in this time of, uh, I guess, physical social distancing, whatever you want to call it, uh, but also the inability to travel and meet new people. So it's good to have so many of you here um, and to have you present as we have this discussion. Um, so the goal here is really to allow for an open exchange between our inaugural group and our new group. Uh, and the focus is really gonna be on how your organizations, how you as young professionals have been working to kind of find solutions around transport and mobility uh, in this whole new world of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so we wanna hear from you. We wanna give each of you an opportunity to speak and to um, to really help educate other people in the sustainable low carbon transport sector uh, on how each of you are really coping, but also learning and building from, from the pandemic and helping to make transport better. Because uh, that's really the goal. We're seeing every day the impacts the pandemic is having uh, on transport and mobility in cities all over the world. We're seeing people in the global north, for example, and around the global south as well, moving back to cars in, a, in a unprecedented numbers. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing public transit taking a big hit. Um, but at the same time, we're also seeing some positive trends around active mobility, around uh, um, tactical urbanism. We're seeing an increase in use in cycling in some places. So there's a lot of interesting trends happening. And I think all of you probably have a lot of good things to say about this. So. What we want to do now is give the floor to each of you to give a little opening. Um, we sent earlier some guiding questions. Um, and the first one is really about you telling us about how COVID-19 is impacting the city in which you work. Okay, so when you're taught when you're telling us about how those the, the pandemic is impacting your city, maybe you can throw in a bit of how your organization is also rising to the challenge 
to deal with some of these problems. So let's start, let's go through our little list here. I, I'm going to try to be as fair to everybody, but I know Edna, if you could hear us, Edna had mentioned that she has to leave early for another meeting. So Edna, if you can hear us, if you want to kick us off, we'd be more than happy to give you the floor. Hi, hi, Chris. Hi, Edna, <laughs> good to hear your voice. <laughs> hi, everyone. I hope you're well. Um, it's good to see all of you. Just to say congratulations to the new cohort of the young leaders. I'm sorry, I know it's a lot of Zoom meetings for all of us. I'm rushing to another one um, after 15 minutes. So I'll just be quick. I'll try and take maybe five minutes or so. Um, and I think also um, having Cyprien there, you're in good hands. She knows a lot on what's already going on um, in Nairobi. So I guess I would say that some of the impacts we've seen um, of COVID-19 and transport here in Nairobi Perhaps the first um, impact was for the public transport sector. They had to undertake measures, of course, to ensure physical distancing. They had to have sanitizers for the passengers. And of course, it ends up you know, being very expensive for them to be able to comply because they have to clean the vehicles often, um, as well as provide you know, the sanitizers. And in some instances on some of the routes, the costs were actually being pushed to the consumers. So I guess that brings into light um, maybe how, how does a private run industry actually offer social protection for, for consumers? So I think it's also made us reflect a lot um, within Nairobi and how we want to continue running our public transport sector because ours is mainly provided by private um, entrepreneurs and we call them matatus or minibuses. So that was the first um, thing that I think was very apparent that many people um, experienced. And there were also instances where, um, you know, people were not getting easy access to transport because of the car few hours. They were really tight at the beginning. So again, we see a situation where it's more likely that, you know, lower income groups or captive users have to take the heat because they don't have other alternatives. They don't have personal motorization. They can't afford taxis. So that's what we saw. Um, I would say something, um, something we've also seen was more increase increase in the use of border borders or what we call motorbikes. So with you know with all the challenges in public transport, the motorbikes become um, more accessible. They are more convenient. People are also using them a lot for shopping because we were we were moving a lot less. So if you want your stuff from the market, the supermarket, you have your um, motorbike um, person deliver it for you. It was another interesting thing to see um, that the motorbike um workers want also wanted also to be registered as for frontline users or sorry frontline workers and to get um certain you know some of the reprieve that frontline workers were getting in terms of work work hours and whatnot so that was another interesting thing to see and then um for non-motorized transport i think we have seen gains I would say I have seen gains myself. Why? Um, quite a number of people, of course, because of lockdown and working from home, there is more and more interaction with your neighborhood. So you're stuck there with your kids and you have to you have to figure out how you're going to entertain them in the evening. I see people trying to bike with their kids, walking around, and I'm seeing lots and lots of volumes of people also exercising outside. So I think it's making us, you know, confront certain issues like, you know, do we have infrastructure that's safe? Are you comfortable with the air quality? You know, the safety issues. That's a big thing that we have seen. Um, and of course, for us in Nairobi, we've had um, some shift in terms of governance where transport planning, health and environment, which was previously under the county government, is now under a newly established body, Nairobi Metropolitan Services, which is under the office of the president. And we have seen quite a bit of investment in non-motorized transport facilities. There's recarpeting of roads. There are a few new cycling paths. And there's also some um, revamped walking paths. Okay, maybe there, um, there are a bit of um, concerns about meeting design guidelines and whatnot, but generally I would say on the city level, there's sort of political goodwill now, and there's more and more conversation. Actually, we've seen more and more articles, you know, in the newspaper talking about cities for people, planning, street design. So I think COVID in that um, regard has brought 
um, some sort of you know introspection. People are thinking more about where they live and how to make their cities more livable. That's it from my end. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. That's that's a really great summary, I think, of what a lot of cities are facing globally, um, but especially in the South. Uh, this issue with private sector, public transport, and informal transport, I think, is a big it's a big problem when it comes to equity, I think, especially when so many people around the world only have access to that kind of transport. Um, so thank you, Edna. I hope I wish you luck in your next call and whatever else you're doing now. Um, so now I want to bring it back to the rest of you and try to have a bit more of an informal conversation around some of these topics. So let's go next. So we're going from Nairobi. Let's stay in Nairobi. Supreme, why don't you add a bit more to what Edna was talking about, especially in your work as a, as a planner? What have you been seeing, I think, in terms of impacts and trying to rise to that challenge provided presented by the pandemic? Um, hi, everyone. Well, it's been, as Edna had said, it's been a very interesting um, few months in Nairobi. Uh, the curfew particularly presented a huge challenge for um, workers. Uh, initially, we had a, a curfew from that started at uh, seven in the, uh, I think it was six in the morning until three, until seven in the evening. Yeah, so you needed to have left your office at around three in order to make to make it home by seven. So we had a lot of businesses that were closing at three. And, you know, once they get to the bus stages to get their public transport, they're so crowded. So a lot of people actually ended up getting home late because uh, the public trans uh, the public transport operators are also scared to be outside after curfew. So they were also closing their businesses early. Um, we did have some negative um, results of that, um, you know, police brutality <laughs> because of that. Um, but it's it's changed now. We have more time. I think now the curfew uh, was extended till 9 p.m. So people don't have to leave work early. Um, and another thing Edna mentioned was uh, specific individuals uh, with specific tasks or careers needed to have permits. So like uh, uh, doctors, um, policemen, and people who are considered to be uh, providing vital services. So they need, they had uh, permits and they could move about. And it's, yeah. <laughs> I feel like we, 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 we're starting to get to a point where people are acknowledging the fact that this is going to be the new norm. People have to get home early and gatherings are not allowed it, until today we are not allowed to have big gatherings so that has really affected the work that i do because i work a lot with groups of people so for the past three months i've not been able to hold even one meeting <laughs> and a lot of the people that i work with are still um analog something like having a zoom meeting is uh, very foreign to them so most of the meetings have not been successful so i've just been sitting up <laughs> sitting at home and reading a lot and just you know chatting with people uh, on phone but not having a lot of the uh, online meetings as much as I would have loved to um, yeah and, and I think that's something we tend to forget especially some of us who are sitting in our home offices um, mm -hmm. in major cities is that a lot of people may not have access to that kind of technology um, even if they are working like you do you're working with people who may not have access to that your your work is completely stalled what do you do um it's a big problem huh? <laughs> sorry yeah, did you it is to add no to no, that? no um I'm not much on the on that topic but something that happened to me personally was um when you have since they 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 uh, we are not allowed to have big gatherings something as intimate as a funeral we were only allowed to have 15 people at the funeral so i lost my mom i a couple of weeks a few weeks ago and we were not allowed to have all our family members at the funeral so that was very that was very sad and yeah. it was it's enlightening, you know, African funerals are very expensive. So it ended up being a more affordable funeral, but a very restrictive, very tight, um, almost scary funeral. But yes, but it's, things are, uh, things are getting better in Nairobi. We have uh, um, a lot of footpaths being built. We have bike uh, cycle tracks being built. It's 
it's amazing. I don't even, I think a lot of people will come back to the city and be surprised just how much um, non-motorized transport development is taking place. And they're setting up um, uh, public transport uh, bus stages outside of the central business district. Because we have a, a lot of a lot of the uh, overcrowding we have in Nairobi is most of it is caused by poor tra uh, public transport networks and there's a lot of overcrowding that comes from that. So having satellite bus uh, bus stages will also encourage more people to to walk and cycle uh, because Nairobi is the CBD itself is not so big, but yeah. Yeah, and and. and yeah, in our work, at least from SLOCAT, we're seeing a lot of examples of like what I was saying before, tactical urbanism, where mm -hmm. cities are trying to find new ways of allowing for greater mobility. Um, and you're seeing a lot of this change around non-motorized transport. So it's really good to hear that Nairobi is also. Thank you for sharing, Sabrine. It's very touching. Oh, you're to welcome. To hear all that. Um, so moving on now, and again, this is informal. So if somebody wants to add or, you know, comment on anything being said, please do raise your hands. But since we're in Africa still, let's move to Sedle. Um, and also because I think similarly, similarly to Green, you also work with a lot of people who may not have access to Zoom or any of these online tools. So what can you tell us about what's happening in Adam? And I almost didn't have access today. I'm very happy to be on the call successfully. If I drop off, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, there's really there's really low like internet penetration in the country, especially now because we're, we have a lot of like social unrest going on. Um, so I'm grateful to be connected on a satellite connection with all of you today. Um, the city, I think, was similar to what uh, Edna and Supreme were saying in terms of um public transit basically the model share in addis i didn't say where i live i live in addis Ababa, Ethiopia. um 85 percent of the modal share in the city is around 50 percent of people walking or using active mobility and then around 35 percent public or collective transport similar to matatus we, we just call them minibuses here or taxis um is how most people get around but then they've reduced the um the I guess quantity of people or the ratio of people that can go into the minibuses or the or the trains because we have a light rail train system. So it's the buses and the minibuses are running at 50% capacity and then the light rail trains running at 25% capacity actually. Um, and similar to what Edna was saying, the, the price has often doubled for the passengers just so that it's affordable for the drivers. Um, and I guess there was a period where they were doing like pico y placa, like how they have in Latin America, where you drive only on certain days based of based on your license plate ending. But there was a lot of uproar from the very vocal car owning minority, and so that didn't last very long. Um, but I think, I mean, active mobility still continues. We have everyone is legally required to wear a mask. Um, I've been cycling a lot more because it's less scary with less cars on the street. Um, but I think it's also like we don't have a proper lockdown going on just because it's not possible in a, in a country full of essential workers and people who will lose their lives much faster from hunger or poverty than they will from a pandemic. So it's more kind of uh, relocating basic things like markets will maybe be more distributed, but not necessarily like just closed altogether because that's people's livelihoods. Um, so actually, if you've been to Addis before and we're here now, it doesn't look massively different. I guess there's more with like the international travel that the since our airport is like the biggest, well, we have the biggest airline in the in the continent. That's really slowed down a lot. It's mainly cargo. You have to do quarantine if you arrive by um, by flight to the country. But we still have like people coming in through the borders, like land borders around Kenya, Djibouti, all that. So yeah there's just so many things happening at once here that it's not you know it's not the only agenda topic it's not the pandemic there's so many more but but we're i think i think it's an exciting moment i guess i'll talk about that later when we say the second question about what's like the opportunities that are coming but like the country launched the nmt strategy last month on world bicycle day and just the idea is to have nearly a thousand um kilometers of pedestrian infrastructure put in and around, I think it's between three and 500 of cycling infrastructure. So I think it's also providing the moment to say, we can make space for the majority 
we can plan for the majority, especially in a moment where that's also most beneficial for public health. Yeah, I mean, it, it's nice to hear that because I know there's a lot happening now around ethnic strife in Ethiopia, um, mm -hmm. a lot of protests like we have in the U.S. now <laughs> around different racial and social justice issues. So yeah. a lot of things are happening in a lot of places and yet life still has to go on, right? So mm -hmm. I hear that there is some kind of plan around increasing opportunities for active mobility. Um, and kind of segueing from that discussion, you mentioned Latin America because I know you've worked there before. Um, so I want to give the floor now to Thomas who works in Latin America in, in Bogota. Uh, to give us a bit of his insights and experiences and maybe tell us a bit of some of the work that's happening in the spacio to kind of help the city deal with the pandemic. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a wild time, hasn't it? Um, so here at the spacio, we're, we're, um, we're, you know, we've adapted to the pandemic. Actually, uh, we got the news uh, back uh, last Friday that we're actually getting rid of the office. So there's some uh, more mundane changes going on as well. Uh, got used to uh, working from home. Um, got the setup here, and um, you know it's actually quite. It's not too bad. And Bogota is lovely without all the cars. It's really, uh, you know, it's, it's they call themselves a world cycling capital or cycling capital of the world. Uh, but it's only now really that um, that it's that it's actually enjoyable uh, to go out on a on a on a weekday and and actually cycle around. Um, most of you will probably have heard of the, all the all the temporary cycling infrastructure. So I've been on, on nearly the whole entire length of the network, which is uh, almost 100 kilometers of, of temporary cycling infrastructure, uh, which is a, it's a very exciting thing, uh, mostly as well because uh, a large part of it will become uh, permanent. So uh, this is probably what what I'm thinking most about right now is you know what's what's going to happen. Um, you know, in the, in the coming months, uh, when do do these changes to our cities, um, these temporary changes have long lasting effects or um, will they just blow over and will we go back to some kind of normality, um, which obviously is not very normal at all. Um, so cycling here is seen as a, as a solution mostly to uh, to overcrowded public transport, which uh, even as, as we reopen again, uh, the quarantine becomes relaxed, um, public transport capacity is very limited and uh, well, the buses here are just completely full, uh, usually. Uh, so as an alternative, they've created these temporary cycle lanes, uh, usually parallel to the, to the mass transit routes. And uh, Bogota is a leading city. Uh, we've uh, now started working in, in other parts of Latin America uh, to uh, implement temporary cycle lanes as well. And there's a very exciting program in Peru, which we're uh, supporting. Uh, we created a guide for them and uh, we're supporting some specific cities, but in total, they will be implementing temporary cycle lanes in more than 40 cities across the country, uh, which is very exciting. And for those of you that are not very familiar with Peru well basically it only has one big city and the rest of the cities are all actually quite small so it's it's very interesting to see how this model travels from a very large uh, established cycling culture city like Bogota to um, small towns in the Amazon of Peru uh, so it's a very very interesting thing um, to to see how how these changes are happening in, you know in, in the space of a couple of months uh, cities that never had done anything to promote cycling are now uh, thinking about their cycling network and uh, how to lay it out, um, which is which is really interesting to be on the forefront of this uh, this development. Um, I mean, as to uh, how life is here, I mean, can't really uh, comment. Uh, I mean, there's not much not much going on really. Uh, beyond uh, what, what, what's already been mentioned, you know, large gatherings obviously are, are, are limited. Um, informal workers, uh, you know, vulnerable populations are on the street and uh, there's really no social safety net. So it's really a health disaster waiting to happen. Uh, and it's happening right now, actually. Colombia, we were spared the, the worst for a long time and, and, and now it's catching up. We had, everyone says here, you know, we had a, we had a 
quarantine when there were no cases and we have a we're getting out of quarantine as the cases are rising so this is really a really dangerous situation and i imagine there's similar things going on in in, in other countries in latin america and, and in, in africa as well um where you know and it's it's just impossible to do what what has been done in asia or in europe uh, and it's not it's not due to some kind of you know bad governance as in maybe the case of the us or brazil it's just um, the social dynamics just make it very difficult to to actually stop this uh, stop this virus. Uh, so exciting things and also troubling things going on here in Colombia. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Thomas. Um, Hi there. I'm Sadla, and I, I lived I lived in Colombia for a few years, and I wanted to ask. Because before I moved to Bogota, I had never been in a single bicycling accident. And then I just packed them all in in my time in Bogota. And I think a main part is I was bringing like my aggressive Montreal cycling mentality to Bogota, which wasn't working. But also, I found it difficult that the cycling lanes are on this in the same space with pedestrians. It, it creates this weird tension that I don't think needs to exist between kind of like marginalized commuters. And I just wanted to know, like with the pop-ups that you're doing now or the temporary cycling lanes, is there is there more effort to make them separate or protected cycling lanes, or is it still gonna be kind of mixed in with the pedestrian infrastructure? Right, um, yeah, it's a, a historic mistake, what they did. Um, you know, this famous guy, Peñalosa, everyone thinks he's a hero, uh, but, in terms of the cycling lanes he really messed it up and it's just created this culture where it's normal to cycle on the sidewalk even if there's no uh, cycling lane it's just kind of assumed that's that that's your place uh and then you know there, there are two directions and they're they're on some of them are on really busy commercial streets and you got cyclists coming from all sides and every time you cross a road you have to you have to go down and then up again and there's a bunch of bunch of you know obstacles uh, whether it's uh, holes in the road or a pylon or something that Terrible. I never use it. So I I I I don't know when why with your aggressive cycling mentality you were using the sidewalk routes. You should have just been on no, the road. I would go I would go on the road sometimes, but then I thought this is probably a terrible idea for my life. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I, I haven't had any any bad accidents. Uh, you know, I had a few scrapes and this kind of stuff, but. Um, Actually, for me, you know, I, I'm from the Netherlands, so it's it's also been quite a change. Um, more more in terms of you know, it's a completely different uh, situation for cycling. And uh, so in the Netherlands, you would almost never ride on the road with fast cars, but here it's 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 almost necessary. Uh, and you know, personally, I've I, I love it. I've uh, I've bought a fixie. I'm uh, thinking of getting a road bike. And um, it's these things that I would have never done in the Netherlands, but obviously I'm a strong and fearless cyclist. Um, the big challenge now is, you know, how do we go from this, you know, we're talking about 7% modal share, three quarters of those are men. Um, and they're mostly young men from lower economic groups as well. So how do you kind of amplify this and uh, you know prevent as well because these young men with low incomes as soon as they get more money they might buy a motorcycle so it's a very fragile motor share to be honest um and how do we get women on the bikes how do we get other age profiles other risk profiles um so this is the big challenge and uh, you'll be glad to know that all the temporary lanes are actually on the road uh some of them are really badly done some of them are great uh, so it really depends. Uh, obviously, Bogota is kind of patched together at the best of days, um, but they're now implementing some of these um, some of these lanes permanently, basically. Um, and it's paint on the road, and they're just taking uh, road lanes, so uh, no more conflicts with pedestrians, um, no more fighting for limited space. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of things you can say about the design. It's definitely not optimal. Uh, you know, it's some some of the stuff I work on. Uh, but what they're doing the best they can really with limited resources and limited space. And um, so, for instance, uh, you'll know the Carrera Septima. It now has a cycle lane. I mean, it's in the middle of the road, which isn't good. It's bidirectional. It's not good. But <clears> it's, it's, there's a cycle lane on the Septima. And that's that's a sea change in Bogota. That's that's, you know, it's the, <laughs> the number one most emblematic avenue in, in Bogota. It's a, it's a traffic jam, uh, you know, 24-7. Uh, and they've they've taken a lane and they've made it into a cycle lane. 
so uh, yeah. we'll see what happens um but you know there's definitely uh we've got a, we've got a very interesting mayor now in bogota um first uh, female mayor of bogota uh, who was also very much a cycling advocate um before so uh, so it's definitely looking good for that yeah thank you for that i mean it's really good to hear kind of these i mean i'm sure many people don't know about all these aspects of some of the struggle that's happening now in trying to make these new permanent these new lanes permanent and to kind of fit in all the needs of of different users and different people in uh, in the city but i'm glad you brought up gender issues because i want to give the floor to sima who's our our resident gender expert when it comes to transport and mobility uh to give us also some of her insights i know you're currently living in in new york um <clears throat> and not in new york city but um maybe you have some insights of what's happening back home back in chandigarh and punjab um so we give the floor to you Seema. sure thank you thank you chris um so yes i am in us and right now the place i'm in is ethica which is a much smaller university town where um with a population of about 35,000 people, two third of which is university students. So with the shutdown and university students moving out, it's it's been more or less a ghost town. So it's not, not a lot of people here, no traffic, no congestion. So it's been good. People uh, are happily walking around, cycling around, which we see is also something that's that's been picking up in other parts of the world. Uh, with that and in comparison to that in india uh, it's increased motorized travel in a certain way because uh, one the transport systems uh, have any ways been very uh, capacity constrained they have been limited services uh, in my hometown back uh, in india so the the services have been low they have been further reduced because of you know uh, financial implications of a shutdown has also been on the transport sector in terms of you know how to recover these costs so there have been uh, you know a reduction in the frequency of these systems and use of these systems and you know so there is a big question on uh, the other uh, on a lot of projects that were in the pipeline and which were supposed to be privately and uh, so be funded through a ppp pro uh, you know project so that those questions remain like how does that move ahead uh, and how do we sustain some of these changes that are good and what is worth keeping what do we move on so there is a lot of like a uh, discussion around that and there was some announcement by the ministry of uh, urban development yesterday which was to kind of pedestrianize some of the markets and create better pedestrianized zones in uh, most of the cities in India, uh, the medium and large size, uh, size cities, and this to be done on an urgent basis. So that's a welcome move. Uh, and uh, But on the other side, when the formal public transport supply is so limited, uh, paratransit and informal modes uh, are, you know, the primary modes there. Now, uh, when most of these transport supply have been cut short, women particularly kind of emerge as uh you know the user group that's hit most because because one they do not have access uh you know they do not have primary access to a motorized vehicle at the household level so when that's not there and when that's being used by somebody else the other thing is also the use of uh the technology led which we talked about access to technology so the ubers of the world uh and also, COVID have put questions on the carpooling model, which is a more common model in uh, Indian cities, at least not so much in US, but Uber, uh, Pool or, you know, Ola Share, where you share rides with, uh, you know, other passengers. So and and uh, my research also kind of uh, talked or um, found that uh, you know, it's it's a more common way of moving around or accessing jobs or other activities for women than men because of, again, the uh, access issues to vehicle at the household level. So in that sense, like where, where and how do uh, these inequalities emerge and how do we address these inequalities? These inequalities have already have existed always, but definitely COVID has kind of, you know, made them a little more, um, they, the situation has exacerbated in a way where uh, it puts question on, on 
a lot of these things like how do you address these so also not only on lines of gender but also age groups and also you know uh, what does it mean for ch children's mobility and other things so um, yeah those are the things where you know uh, there are a lot of questions being raised uh, the other thing is also and particularly in case of developing world and uh, you know uh, chandigarh and my area of work uh, is is the bike and walking infrastructure the design of these things like what kind of widths do we need to rethink the walking uh, footpaths width and what like how do we how do we look at that in in the new uh, new norms of you know social distancing in light of those norms how do we rethink capacities how do we rethink densities those the density has been a precursor for like compact successful development so far but but uh, you know in developing world these densities are far more higher than what we kind of look at uh, in the in global mm -hmm. north so what where do we go from there so those are some questions which i i think uh, you know uh, developing countries would have to answer uh, in a different way and you know from uh, the other thing and coming back to ethica uh, the town i'm in in us right now uh, so one important implication with reduced travel and you know the covid was also that the city decided to make the public transport free because they wanted to ensure that the uh, that the uh, there is contactless interface and interaction between the drivers and passengers to ensure a safe uh, environment uh, for travel so now i so because it's a smaller city because it's a subsidized transport also by the university and the city does it it's it is possible and they're able to do it but what does it mean for bigger cities like you know so that's also a big question where do you find the balance between uh, between transport as a basic service versus you know as a money making enterprise uh, so you know those kind of questions uh, the other thing is cycling and i was uh, impressed by all the work that uh, thomas shared is happening in bogota here uh, on the other side we had line bikes which was uh, you know a bike sharing program but uh, because of you know people not preferring uh, shared kind of bikes here and you know choosing to go for the individual bikes line has decided to move out so here the question probably becomes more important of uh, in terms of access and use for people who do not have personal vehicles and it's a slightly hilly town so you know so the older generations and again uh, women who have to use strollers for kids and stuff so you know uh, if if you don't have public transport providing the service as it does on a normal day and uh, you know bikes moving out shared mobility reducing ubers it's it's very difficult to find ubers there's hardly any business uh, with people moving out uh, from here so you know so th these are some of the things that that uh, raises important questions for smaller cities and you know versus uh, things happening in the developing world yeah it really gets to the heart of, of what is the purpose of, of transport really is it is it a service is it is it just to move things from point a to point b um and and are the users let's say are the passengers actually getting what they need out of it uh, and sometimes right. we forget of the very diverse needs of passengers um especially as you were saying women people with children older persons um lots of interesting stuff that you brought up there so i want to take it now to erica who is our resident behavioral specialist <laughs> uh who does her research in psychology around transport use um, so please tell us what you're seeing. I know you're living in Sweden, but your background you're, is Brazil. So if you want to tell us a bit about what's happening in your home country, in your hometown, I believe you said you're from which city? I'm forgetting now. But, Gothenburg. Uh, I'm, I'm based in Gothenburg. Yes. So take it away, Erica. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you, some of you. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, my background is from psychology and behavior, so that's more like what I'm looking for now on this great big experiment with society, because that's what looks like, what is going to happen after COVID. Uh, we don't really know. It, it feels kind of really living a social experiment that we read on old books. but. So for, for, from, from what I have seen so far and um, what I would kind of 
what are my, my forecasts, I think, is that habit and uh, social norms that usually is quite strong aspects in transportation, it, those, uh, those have changed that drastically. Uh, let's say, let's compare, for example, Sweden and Brazil, which are my, my main backgrounds and quite different ways of dealing with COVID, like that both countries had very drastic ways to lead um, with the with the, the situation. Uh, Sweden has been criticized criticized quite a lot for being uh, well, quite quite uh, open for for the situation and haven't haven't had so many restrictions compared, for instance, with Brazil. Um, and differently from Brazil, I think uh, in, in Sweden, people didn't see this as uh, the situation as necessarily a moral or some sort of uh, ideological positioning. Uh, so when you talk with Brazilians, if you do uh, lockdown or if you stay at home, you have some sort of ideology behind. And this didn't happen in Sweden. So if you if you are not in lockdown, you have disorientation, and probably means that you are pro government, pro Bolsonaro, and that that, that that makes things even more difficult to deal because it's like a how can I say it's like a a phantom behind the the the, the political uh, orientation of people. If, if how you deal with COVID is also uh, your how, which president you are going to vote for the next elections. It's, it's really strange, the connection, and this affects a lot uh, people's well-being and also gives a lot of uh, insecurity and uncertainty that deals with uh, their psychological way of living in this, this time. Um, the Society of Psychology, Brazilian Society of Psychology, they just published a book, uh, unfortunately in Portuguese only, but uh, showing some uh, characters of uh, typical uh, people living in society now with COVID, and um, they, they, it was really interesting because they divided people based on their uh, work contract and how they are dealing with this situation. And quite a lot of people have have seen work and going to work and uh, having something to do as a moment to unplug or to relax um, because they cannot think so much on, on COVID all the time. So I think Brazil and Sweden, they are really, really two different bubbles of uh, of uh, of the situation. So like when it comes to specifically things that have been happened here in Sweden, is that um, so parking fees have been reduced by 50%. So there there's been a high increase in use of private cars, and uh, people are even encouraged to use the private cars in this situation. Um, there has been also uh, for risk groups of uh, of COVID that there there's been a lot of services for elderly, especially because this was the main critique to Sweden that the country hasn't dealt so well with uh, public health for for this risk group. So they are trying to come with new measures for that. Uh, gatherings they are allowed actually, but not uh, more than 50 per people. So it, until then, you can you go to the streets and you don't really see the difference. Um, it's quite quite been quite relaxed uh, policy regarding that. But I think that there, there there are some interesting things from my organization at least. Uh, the Institute of Psychology, the university, they are following all the the, the recommendations from the public health uh, agency. And um, so there, there's been a lot of support for PhD students. So possibilities of extension of their contracts because um, they may not have been feeling so productive as they, they were in a normal situation. Um, there's been a lot of support for Zoom uh, meetings and also for preparing classes. I, I think before here we had not so strong, but at least a bit of a of the culture of the idea of flipped classroom in which you study at home and then you go to the class to to just to to pose your questions and have a discussion so i think this 
uh, helped a lot because a lot of us were already prepared with classes online already. So some of us already knew the technology. So it was a kind of smooth process for those that were have, already have this culture, right? It's not uh, everyone, but at least it was a facilitator, I would say. Um, I think we, uh, I'm not quite sure how is it uh, going in the practice, practice, because I'm not going to the institution, but as far as I know, we, uh, some people are going, so the building is not empty, people are still going to work, some of them, if they want. Um, when it comes to transportation around Sweden, uh, when it was announced in mid-March, uh, the issue of COVID, um, data from cell phones, they, they showed that there was a really strong reduction on, uh, it was a, a, about 20% that less travels around the whole country. But we had uh, a heat wave two weeks ago, and unfortunately, everyone started to, to travel around as, as normal as last year, as, as if nothing was happening. So I don't know if, uh, how is it going, because summer is quite important for in this part of the world uh, and people value a lot sunlight. So I don't know if it's going, this trend is going to continue or if it's going to reduce again. I'm not sure because in terms of transportation, public transportation, the only recommendation is that um, uh, the public service should avoid crowding and offer more more availability of the transport. So I, 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 I'm not sure, I, I want to see what is going to happen now, if it's going to decrease yeah. or keep the same level. Yeah. And, um, well, yeah, I think that's yeah. what I would like to, to highlight from Sweden and a bit from Brazil. <laughs> Thanks for sharing those two perspectives, because um, I, I know a lot of you have multiple perspectives, having lived and work in, in many different places. Um, but it's always good to hear what is happening and, and where you are and how your organizations might be trying to make the situation better. Um, but I want to transition a bit now to something radically different from what all of you have been talking about, and that is freight transport. Um, and Agnivesh is now our resident freight expert. <laughs> Eva is our gender expert, Erica is our general expert, and all of you have a lot of expertise in different things, but Agnivesh actually works a lot on freight issues. And this is probably something that, I mean, at least in terms of data, there's probably lots of interesting trends happening around what you're seeing in COVID um, in, in this pandemic era. So I know the question is, the questions we've been posing to you has been about opportunities and, and, and issues, but I know because your work is, is unique, we'd like to hear from you uh, in terms of some of the changes you've been seeing around freight transport um, and maybe how you think those might change or remain the same or how things are going in, in as we come out of this current stage of Absolutely. Actually, before I talk about freight, I just wanted to add a little bit on the passenger travel pattern changes as well. So, <laughs> sure. uh, so <laughs> apart from the economic and the health impacts that we have been seeing that faced by COVID, one thing that has been glaringly evident for me is the how it's affecting the low income communities in our cities quite you know, disproportionately. So the housing crisis in the city that I am in, uh, Memphis is in Tennessee, it has been quite significant how people are not able to pay the rents in the cities and are moving to the other suburban regions. And the long term impacts of these trends on uh, urban mobility is going to be quite concerning because uh, there is a huge increase in the car ownership levels and definitely this is going to have long term impacts in the emission as well as that the, the commuting time so that is one area that we are currently working on and coming back to freight one thing that uh, really concerns me is that how people make this travel substitution because as consumers we always have this choice of physical travel or e-commerce right so because of social distancing, most of us are purchasing increasingly the products online. So the challenges in the last mile are growing exponentially. How do you make sure that all these freight deliveries to the cities are done in the most sustainable manner? So this is a question that uh, we, uh, we, we really need to think about now. And especially when we talk about supply chain, supply chain is something that we always used to design with uh, seasonality in mind. We always had regularity in the patterns. So COVID-19 has kind of thrown out all the seasonality in our studies. 
So we are currently trying to understand how do we deal, deal with this uncertainty in our supply chains? How do we ensure that our supply chains are more flexible, more resilient? So these are two patterns that we have been seeing a lot. And in terms of last mile deliveries, particularly, there's a lot of uh, emphasis given to autonomous delivery robots nowadays. Because of the need for contactless deliveries, we can see that a lot of delivery robots are coming to the market. And previously, before the pandemic, while there was a lot of skepticism about uh, this delivery robot, people have suddenly turned to these e eager users when we talk about robots. So in most of the US cities currently, these delivery robots are coming in. The impacts of these delivery robots on the sidewalks of the cities are something of interest to me and something that we, are, we have been trying to work as well. What kind of regulatory challenges are there? How do we make sure that these delivery robots can be a viable option for reducing the emission from the last mile uh, deliveries? So that is another trend that we have been seeing, particularly to the freight deliveries. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> always, there's always something interesting to hear, like when it comes to this element of transport, because I think a lot of us really do focus on passenger transport. Uh, and what you're bringing up is kind of like the intersection between the two, because if you have these delivery robots making, I guess, these smaller scale deliveries. Absolutely. Yeah. Within, within possibly two miles. Yes. Yeah, you, you end up seeing like kind of these videos and memes online in which people are walking into them, they're afraid of them. <laughs> it really creates a lot of these interesting um, intersection between mobility and movement and then also this deliveries that are happening now, especially in the age of, of physical distancing. So, so I want to give the floor now to Hero, who I think is a bit unique in, in the sense that he is not necessarily working on transport and mobility issues. He does live in a, in, a, in a global north city at the moment. He's living in Japan too. Uh, so if you want to give us some quick perspectives on what you've been seeing, how you've been dealing with it. I know now you're technically working in Bangkok because you're working for UNSCAP, but you haven't gone to Bangkok yet. So <laughs> for now you're stuck in Japan. So what can you tell us, Hiro? Hi, can you hear me well? Yes, we could hear you. Oh, great. Um, sure. So, yeah, so I have not been able to, to go to Bangkok so that um, I live in now in Nagoya, which is third to fourth largest city in Japan. Uh, so I would give, but just before that I was in Yokohama, so I, I hope I can give you a bit of, you know, what's going on in Japan. Um, so as all of you guys have shared, I mean, there is a, a big, big decline of use of transport, public transport uh, in urban areas. So, um, for us with the interesting figures, that's um, actually Japan is kind of completely divided into two in the sense of using public transport. So, uh, on average, people live in Tokyo use 860 times of public transport per person per year, while the rest of the country is below the half of what the Tokyo people use. So you can see that Tokyo is intensively relying on the public transport. And there has been um, yeah, big changes in the behavior in the use of public transport. So. I mean, as many people say, these people started to do the uh, remote work or telework as they start to rely on those um, classes um, and also use of like Uber Eats. So interestingly, in, in the Tokyo or even Yokohama, uh, where it, which is very uh, intensively urban, there are increase of user bicycle for both commuting and those um, heavily, but that has been creating a bit of tensions of sort of use of roads because if if you come to Japan, you realize that Japan is absolutely not friendly to the bicycle. So usually bicycle riders need to use pedestrian at the same road with them. So if you're actually riding the bicycle on the road where the car's driving then they will honk you and so on so i mean now it's getting different in terms of like now bicycle have more ownership sort of uh, of the road but it's uh, being a big issue so we've seen an increase of 
accent, obviously, it's less because there's less people, but there are more nuances coming in um, when they talk about Uber is in the riders crashing to the bar and cars and so mm -hmm. on. Um, so it has been a big issue, but clearly there is an use of bicycle for commuting, which I think is a good sign. So in I think what really makes such a huge changes of behavior in terms of use of uh, public transport, I mean, as far as I see, uh, coming from sort of, you know, how Japanese follow the order from the top. And I think that goes to both Korea and China, where we have, you know, massive hierarchical sort of Confucianism, I'd say. So, I mean, you see that, um, like, a very strict regulation aren't in place at all, but do follow the rule. So what happened is uh, it has been creating a bit of a tension between um, people who actually need to do the business, including those who are using public transport or people driving the trucks and so on. So, I mean, there are many news actually that the truck drivers, you know, those carrying the stuff like fleet, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not used to, transport jargon so let me know if i'm using wrong one but um yeah so there's been a bit of um yeah tension between that who actually go across the boundaries of prefectures and yeah i mean it's uh, uh well i mean there has been uh, so many news that um Okay, let's say you are driving a car, right? So you go to a different prefecture, and then when you are away from your car, and then your car was aband like vandalized, like you know, painted the papers on, uh, like saying that go away, go home, and so on. So it's a bit, a bit crazy uh, right now. Um, I just wanted to uh, connect to the my work at the end. Uh, so my work currently is supporting cities to recover economically and financially from the COVID-19 because, as you see, many um, cities have been facing the challenge of um, the build, the, the building economies and also um, financially be able to um, recover from that uh, impact. Um, so what I mean, I, I can speak of other cities in India, but primarily Japanese cities, they have been using their own savings, which they built over the decade. So they've been enabled, to, uh, they have not been able to kind of finance something that helped people to, you, you know, shift to the new um, mode of life, let's say. So in terms of, I mean, we've seen many cities implementing bicycle only lane, uh, you know, sub supplementing sort of bicycle sharing scheme and so on. Many cities haven't done that really. Um, and they have not been able to mobilize any finance for those kind of things. So uh, what worries me is a decline of financial capacity of local government to be able to actually create a shift um, to the new mode of life. Um, because in in seven, the 60s and 70s, where Japan, Japanese cities are transformed into the oven, like society from very sort of agricultural or like rural um, densely populated informal economy, uh, informal habitat, it, they had enough capital to do that because each city managed to have some saving, but now they don't. So the question of how local government to be able to finance uh, transitions, including both tran uh, transport, way of life, commuting, um, consumption behavior and so on which all affects uh inter interconnectedly so um that's something i am curious and i uh, something to study about so oh, thank you here that's it from I mean, me and over to yeah i mean all of you are bringing up such interesting topics you know like I mean, sometimes we always say that the, we sometimes say that the transport, the sustainable low char carbon transport community and the transport sector as a whole, um, we tend to really just speak among ourselves and that's something we're trying to change. I think with programs like this one, where we bring new, new voices, new faces into the work of the community um, and not necessarily people who only work on transport issues, people like Hero who focus on, on, uh, on urban issues, people, um, 
like Cyprien, who's, who's an urban planner, trying to kind of bring new perspectives into how we deal with, with decarbonizing transport. And so having all of your perspectives in this, I think really brings a lot to the community. Um, and we really wanted to use this opportunity to present that, especially now that all of us are dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic um, and in our own work, in our professional lives, trying to come up with solutions to all these problems. Um, I'm really grateful that so many of you mentioned those problems and solutions, um, some of the work that your organizations are doing. I really do hope, like you were saying, Thomas, that, that a lot of these ideas for temporary bike lanes do become permanent. I really do hope um, that the things you've been saying are changes that cities will take seriously. Uh, I know, Sebla, you mentioned some work by the national government that I think is going in the right direction. Um, but sometimes I think we forget how important it is that this infrastructure is not just in terms of decarbonization, but also sustainable development and making sure that nobody is being left behind. Um, we tend to think, I think thanks to the 2030 agendas jargon, that we want to leave no one behind. But unfortunately, the economic system we have actively marginalizes people. So people aren't necessarily being left behind. They're being actively marginalized. And I think all of you are helping to change a little bit of that through the work that you do, whether it's in Nairobi, uh, in Asian cities now, Hero, whether it's on freight, something that is a bit more esoteric, but still equally important to thinking about passenger transport issues. Um, whether it's on gender or, or psychology and behavior, all of you are bringing a little bit of positivity, I think, into the world of transport and mobility. So we really appreciate that and all of your contributions. Um, I'm glad we could have a bit of this sharing and we hope to have some more in the future. So let's see. I just want to give everybody one chance to say one word um, <laughs> to tell us what they think the post-COVID-19 world should look like. So one word whether it's um, decarbonized, sustainable, eco-friendly, or maybe it's something negative. I don't know. Tell me what you guys think. Let's start, let's start with Sable. I'm looking yeah, so, at it. So, so we, also just very quickly, like, yes, please keep it to one word. And then I would also suggest that the person with the most interesting one word is then allowed, or like can then afterwards we will choose one of you to then explain why you choose this one idea. word, like the one with yeah, the most, Nicola, most interesting, most impressive word. You can be the judge of the most interesting word. Okay, so I'll, I'll be the judge. So, <laughs> so, like, so yeah. you will give you the floor. I'm sorry that you're first. It gives you less time to think, but I'm going by how okay, I'll say, I'll say active. Okay, active. That's good. I like that. I think that's a that's the recurring trend of our conversation. Okay, Thomas, you're next. <laughs> Uh, I guess I'll say conscious. Conscious, I do like that one. Mindful, mindful, conscious. I like that a lot. That's actually really good. Hero. Um, radical. Radical. Oh. <laughs> there we go. He's 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 someone who who thinks like me. I know. So Hero and I have a lot in common. Okay, radical. I like that. Agnivesh. Uh, equity. What is it? Equity, equity. Equity, okay. So yeah. equitable, okay, good. Yeah. Supreme. I would say home. Whole, okay. Home. Having... Home, like being at home. home. Okay, good. Something that makes you feel like you're not living in these little bubbles, but maybe something more connected, for me, more homey feeling. Okay. Erica. I would say well being. Well being, good health and well-being something that we all need right now and finally Seema I think I'll go to go with resilient resilient good okay Nicola which one are you judging as our most interesting top uh, term <laughs> um I think of course the most radical term um, <laughs> be the most interesting one so hero maybe if you can make peace <laughs> brief explain why, why radical one Oh, no, <laughs> um, I really didn't think I would be picked. So, um, so the reason why I thought radical was that um, I think we all had um, time to think of how 
did we get here, you know, in terms of economic situation, social situation. And so I think we had the time to reflect and ponder what, why we are here and then why we couldn't have done better. And I think the solutions that we have been hearing, I mean, let's say since 2015 or even 2000, one actually addressing any of the reality of inequality, of injustice, um, you know, like gender violence, for example. I mean, it's intensified. It's it's disgusting. So, I, I mean, I hope that people realize that we see as a sort of incremental and meeting the needs of today and we need to change our thinking fundamentally to do that we need to be radical and be politically brave i would say yeah i i think that is a good summary of what you were trying to say for sure because I, I i know you're here i know what you're trying to say so i think we're on the same page on that so yes we need to we need to definitely be politically brave and i hope each one of us no matter what you're doing, whether it's research, whether you're working on setting up bike lanes in Latin America, whether you're getting people together to, to be more active in how they move and how they get around their cities, all of you are doing your part, I think, <clears throat> to make the world a lot better and to change the trajectory of our future. Um, but yes, that political bravery is definitely needed. Um, we as millennials and Zoomers, I think, I think most of you are millennials, um, so Gen Z and millennials, we, we, we are in this together, really. I mean, something that we've been pondering in SLOCAD as part of our COVID-19 messaging has been around intergenerational solidarity. And I think we as millennials and Gen Zers, we're the ones who've been really affected by this downturn in the economy, by changes in, 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 in the way the world is working. And it really is up to us, I think, to chart a new path, a radical, mindful, um, resilient path forward, just to use some of the words you, you guys have been using. Uh, so let's see. I do hope that all of you are staying optimistic and staying positive. I know sometimes it might be hard, really hard to stay optimistic and positive, but it's so critical that we do and that we kind of take a, a look at the successes that we've been having in our own cities and our own communities and the work that we're doing and try to use that to further give us fuel to work for that better trajectory in the future. Because all of us have so much to contribute, all of us have so much to say and so much to do. And we really embrace all of you and, and are excited to have you as part of the Slowcat family. So our previous generation of young leaders, we're not gonna let you go. Uh, we're working every day to improve this program. And we really wanna make sure that these exchanges continue and all of you can, can kind of work together to, to improve the world in which we live, work, play, and travel. So thank you very much, everybody. I, I hope you enjoyed this. So, and we hope to see you all soon, very soon, hopefully. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good, good day or good evening, good night, wherever you are. <laughs> bye, bye. Yeah, Nico. Bye-bye.